Good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Sprang, and I lead the Energy and Environment Series for the MIT Club of Northern California. I'm delighted to kick off our 2021-22 season featuring top speakers in the fields of renewable energy, electric vehicles, drought in California, and of course, climate change. Our speaker this evening is MIT's Daniel H. Rothman, Professor of Geophysics in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, affectionately called EAPS, whose topic is thresholds of catastrophe in Earth's carbon system. Sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? Well, maybe so, maybe not. Dan will tell us all he knows about the subject and its implications for us in the current time frame. I'll be both the host and the moderator tonight. We have enabled live Q&A, and I'll do my best to get many of those questions to Dan during the Q&A session, along with many of the questions we got from online registration. So now I would like to introduce MIT professor Dan Rockman. Dan, welcome. Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak to our audience about your work, Dan, and the implications it has for all of us here this evening. Dan, a um, little bit of extra information, you know, not just in your biography. You earned a degree in applied mathematics from Brown uh, University in 1979. You worked as a geophysicist for several years, then earned a PhD from Stanford in geophysics and subsequently joined MIT's EAPS department in 1986 as a seismologist. So first of all, please tell us a little bit about what EAPS is all about and why you decided to join that particular organization. So in, in EAPS, we've um, developed a, a sort of four word um, summary of what we're all about, and it's Earth, Planets, Climate, Life. And um, that more or less in a nutshell um, explains in part why I was so attracted to coming here because of its breadth. Great. Um, so, so tell us a little more about your primary area of research at MIT in those early days, namely in seismology. And what circumstances got you to that point? In other words, what led you into that particular field to begin with? Um, it's an easy one, um, chance. <laughs> when I was uh, a senior in college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And um, I, I answered an ad that offered opportunities for foreign employment. And so that immediately meant that I got a job in Texas <laughs> and uh, working in the oil service in this oil exploration industry. And, um, and I, I had the Wonderful luck to, to be hired by uh, an MIT graduate named Ken Larner, who was running a research group at a company called Western Geophysical. I did eventually go to London and uh, I became, I, I, it was a fantastic job and he was a fantastic mentor. And then I went to Stanford where uh, I could pursue similar things. And, and I had another fantastic mentor, uh, John Clairbout. And, um, I did my thesis in, in um, aspects of ex exploration seismology. And uh, one of the great things about being a member of uh, John Clairbout's group at the time was that he, uh, he really encouraged um, uh, free thinking and imaginative thinking uh, uh, about the kinds of seismological problems we were working on. And in trying to, uh, to meet that challenge, I. Um, became aware of all sorts of uh, interesting new ideas in uh, the then burgeoning field of complex systems and nonlinear dynamics and um, became enamored of them and have more or less worked in and around that subject ever since. Great. So now when you were growing up, um, were you already thinking about your future work as a geophysicist? No. Um, <laughs> so, but, but what life experiences led you to go in that direction, even if they came later in your life? And when did you decide to go into the field of geophysics, actually? Oh, I, it was um, the, the first job, the one in Houston. And I, I really, I, you know, as I said, I, my, my boss there was effectively a kind of mentor and, and um, I, I just loved it. And so that, that's, that's why I pursued it. And, you know, one thing led to another. Um, you know, had he not 
um, you know, been, I don't know, inspired or forced, whatever, to, uh, to, to read my resume at the time when it, when it appeared on his desk, who knows where I would have ended up, you know. If I... Great. So now, how did you get from seismology to studying paleontology and looking at what the geological record might tell us about climate change? A long random walk. Um, so, um, so having been exposed to these ideas of complex systems and nonlinear dynamics as a graduate student, I, I became interested in, and, and I should mention statistical mechanics. Uh, I, I became interested in other ways of, of applying such concepts I mean, or other, other, other fields in which they might be applied. And um, when I got to MIT, uh, there was a, a group uh, working on cellular automata, which uh, were discrete dynamical systems that uh, uh, at that point in time, there was this very new idea about how they may be applied to the simulation of fluid mechanics. And I just went for that. And I, I, I spent 10 years working in that subject and um, had a marvelous time. So my, my first 10 years at MIT were, were actually in sort of the intersection of fluid mechanics, statistical, physics, applied mathematics, and various other subjects, and uh, specifically on, on the problem of multi-phase flow. Um, and so I, th that was a wonderful experience, but you know, after 10 years, I, I felt like I'd sort of done what I could and um, became interested in other things. And that, um, because um, the department I'm in is, is so broad, um, I was exposed to a lot of new ideas, uh, or new subjects that I had no particular cognizance of, but I found some of them quite interesting. And uh, among them um, was uh, this subject of the carbon cycle, which um, I began to be interested in it about 20 years ago, which of course is a long time ago, but um, I was already fully promoted by then, you know, I was well into my career. Um, and, but in the beginning, it was a kind of hobby. And uh, now I think it's a, a bit closer to a trade <laughs> or profession. Or whatever. You know, I, 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 for the past several years, I've been pretty solidly into it, doing other things, but that's, that's my main interest. Well, now you and Carrie Emanuel co-founded the Lorentz Center and you're currently a co-director. What is the primary mission of the Lorentz Center at MIT and why did you start it? And what are its major areas of research? So, um, the mission is succinct, it's to learn how climate works, but I should explain um, what we mean by that. Um, what we're trying to do is to make a kind of intellectual home for effectively curiosity-driven research in climate science. So that is that people to come and, and follow their interests and create new things in climate science. And uh, this, we see as, as, as a somewhat distinct, more than somewhat, as distinct from the absolutely important and, and, and very pressing demands for being able to predict the consequences of climate change in the near term. Um, instead, we're trying to develop fundamentals of how the climate system works. And I see the carbon cycle, the subject of this talk, as, as part of that system. Great. So your current research addresses whether Earth will suffer a sixth major extinction, which you're going to tell us about tonight. What are some of the greatest challenges to this kind of research that you've encountered? And how confident are you that you understand what's happened in our geological past and how it applies to our current situation? So uh, as I hope to, to bring across in the talk, um, my view of the subject is, is I, I see it as kind of simple. Um, I look to the past to gain an understanding of how the present and future might, might play out. And uh, the, the pitfall of looking at, to the past is that the, we're left with records of past behavior and the climate system and the carbon cycle, which are spotty at best. Um, I hope you get the idea, you know, that, that the audience get, gets the impression in my talk that there's a lot of interesting information out there and it's maybe more than you might have imagined, but it's hard to interpret. So the biggest challenge by far is, is um, being able to uh, basically construct reasonable interpretations that um, are have some degree of rigor and they're not 
purely stories. <laughs> so, so is it partly because of the incomplete nature of the fossil record as an example? It's partly that. It's partly that, um, as you'll see in the talk, that um, the best records by far are not so much the fossil record, but what we call the geochemical record, basically chemical signatures of various kinds of things and, and, and sedimentary rocks. And it's a bit of a black art to figure out, you know, what that stuff means. And so I, I kind of understood part of my, um, you know, uh, contribution, if you wish, or, you know, in, in recent years has been to develop the black art. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to let you go and make your presentation. Just a second, one last question here is that you became a bit of a celebrity a couple of years ago by an appearance in the documentary Ice on Fire, uh, produced by Leonardo DiCaprio and first shown at the Cannes Film Festival. Now, how did you come by that opportunity? Uh, four years ago, September 2017, that's pretty much exactly four years ago. Uh, I published a paper that received a lot of press attention. And, you know, as these things go, uh, a good bit of the press attention was far more inflammatory than I ever wanted. And that's one reason I got a lot of press attention, I suspect. And so I, I had, if you wish, my 15 minutes of fame. It, it crested, you know, sort of the day of publication. Uh, that brings us to sort of like Wednesday or Thursday of that week. And Thursday was a bit quiet. And on Friday of that week, I got a, a, an email from the uh, director, Lila Connors, um, you know, asking, you know, saying she's going to be in town, you know, can she do an interview with me? And these things happen so fast, you know. And, and I have to say, I, I was a little bit concerned because I thought, you know, who are these people? <laughs> what do they want from me? <laughs> and what are they going to want me to say? And, and um, Instead, I was completely gratified. Uh, she, she, she was a great interviewer. She was basically interested in the science and um, she wasn't particularly interested in the talk, I mean, the, uh, the, the paper that I had just published. She wanted somebody who could speak knowledgeably about the carbon cycle and, and that's what I did. So uh, it worked out. <laughs> so it was a nice experience. Well, that's fun. It's great to be able to do things like that in your life once in a while, I guess. <laughs> Okay, Dan, well, listen, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, tell our audience um, everything you know about the subject. And um, we'll be coming back after you're done for the Q&A session. So best of luck. And we'll see you so I'll share my screen. And here it is. Uh, can you please confirm that you can see the, um... Yes, it looks fine. Okay, we're on. Okay, thank you. And thank, thanks for coming. Okay, so I'm going to begin my talk with um, an iconic data set, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen in one guise or another. Um, this is the famous Keeling curve. It's the um, the uh, rise of um, the pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, since 1960. As you can see, it's risen from about 320 to 420 parts per million. Um, if you haven't seen this before, or haven't thought about it, I'll just point out that one of the um, sort of main features aside from the drastic increase are the uh, seasonal oscillations. And that's because uh, in the Northern hemisphere where the data is collected, um, in the summertime, there's a net uptake of CO2, and in the wintertime, there's a net, there's more CO2 put in the atmosphere than it's taken up. So it's, it's kind of fun to see that one can actually measure that. So I, I have, as an introductory remark, um, two comments to make, or two, two remarks. Um, one is that it's been known since the middle of the 19th century that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And it's been known since the middle of the 20th century in a, in a scientific way that, uh, that the rise is due to um, fossil fuel combustion and, and other human activities, but primarily fossil fuel combustion. You, know, you might be surprised that one even needed to show it, but there was some very clever geochemical work from uh, carbon-14 that, that basically nailed it, right? Um, so what's going on with the CO2 levels? Well. They're established within the carbon cycle. I'll show you a few 
you know, schematics of the carbon cycle, this is the simplest one, right? It, it's a loop. It goes from CO2, plants take up CO2, as some of you probably learned in grade school or, or middle school, and uh, it becomes plants. And con consuming organisms like us consume plants or consume the products of plants that end up elsewhere and put back CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's it in a nutshell, right? Um, what do we know? Well, we know that human activities have disrupted the cycle. That, that was in the previous slide. Uh, and so the question, one of the questions I, I'm addressing in this talk is whether we can expect that the cycle is stable. And I, I mean stable in a dynamical sense. That is, if we you know, increase CO2, put CO2 into the system, will the CO2 levels merely go up because we put CO2 into the system? Or might the carbon cycle or the earth system go off on its own because it's, it's been perturbed and go off on its own in an unstable way so that there's a kind of runaway effect? And so you know, I would say the answer to that second question is uh, we don't know, right? And uh, then the question is how could we know? Right? So fundamentally what this talk is about is trying to make some progress with those questions, right? And one way to make progress is to study um, events in the geologic past, you know, millions of years ago, um, when the carbon cycle was disrupted. And I'll show you what this looks like in the records in a moment. And but basically what this amounts to is a uh, geochemical measurements that show that um, the ocean store of carbon, which is really the store of carbon that one is interested in at time scales beyond say a couple of centuries, right? That the ocean store of carbon changed you know, and sometimes abruptly. Right? And so the sort of another one of the sort of underlying ideas in this talk is that if we study such changes, maybe we'll be able to learn something about how the system works. And the way that's done is um, uh, to, and I'll say more about this too, to, to measure the composition, the chemical composition of the isotopic composition of carbon in rocks. Specifically, this, this um, expression here, which to many of you will look almost incomprehensible and difficult to read, is a, I'll define it clearly in, in, in shortly, but it's, it's basically the carbon-13 content of carbon. Carbon 14 is unstable, but carbon 12 and carbon 13 is stable. So I'll say more about that, but I'd like to just show you what the data looks like first. Uh, it's it's I, before talking about how measurements are made or what they're doing. Well, I, I am showing you where data is collected, but I, I also want to show you what the data looks like before we talk about what it is. And so one of the ways of collecting the data is to um, you know, go out on these um, cruises. Um, and this is um, by the uh, international, it's now called the International Ocean Discovery Program. Right? And you drill holes and you get back um, what are now often referred to as paleoclimate records. Um, and here's an example. Uh, I might say, since we had, you, you took the time for such a nice introduction, that um, my early interest in seismology um, sort of show themselves here because you know such time series um, are interesting to me, and, and and especially I'm interested in you know why these 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 um, peaks occur. You know they, they they seem to occur somewhat abruptly. If there's anyone in the audience who actually knows about carbon isotope geochemistry, um, I, I'm I'm going to tell you now. Notice the negative sign there. So I, I in all my slides I'm, I'm flipping things so that the negative is actually up. So it's somewhat more intuitive, I think, for a general audience to think about peaks rather than you know, spikes going down. So these intermittent peaks are known in the business as, hi as hyperthermal events, right? And they likely represent both higher CO2 levels and warmer climates. And I say likely because it's, you know, the, the, these are plausibility arguments that get built up over the years. Right? And so, I'm going to zoom in on, on these two over here. And actually, um, this is from a core I don't remember. It's either in the Atlantic or Pacific. And I think this is from the, in, in another ocean, right? So it's a global event. And so you see the, you have these two events. And I just want to impart to you um, sort of the fascination of this. Um, 
that the run up to it is kind of flat. There are oscillations and those oscillations can be attributed to uh, changes in Earth's precession, its obliquity and its ex eccentricity, the so-called orbital parameters. Um, but then somewhere around here, um, it's, it's, it's no longer business as usual, so to speak. It just, it just boom, you get this abrupt change. So the question is, you know, why did that happen, right? And then about 100,000 years later, there's another one and then there's nothing again, or, or just these, 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 these low level um, fluctuations. So it's, it's that kind of thing that interests me. You know, and uh, I begin, if you wish, with the uh, sort of instinct that this represents some kind of instability. It may not, but that's it's, it's my scientific instinct and I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, try to make that case, right? Um, there's another kind of data, if we go back further in time, I, I didn't say, but I'm sure you read on the axes, um, those were about 50 million years old from the, um, the Eocene epoch. Um, I've over the years had some uh, fascination with extinctions, mass extinctions. And the greatest of all mass extinctions occurred at the end Permian 252 million years ago. And these are rocks um, deposited at the time of the end Permian extinction. Now, if you're not used to looking at geology, I'll just um, let you know that these rocks used to be arranged um, flat. So they were stacked like pancakes. And then from the action of tectonics, they got tilted. The arrow of time is moving from the lower left to the upper right. And so each layer here kind of represents a different time interval. And the, the extinction interval is somewhere in here, if I recall correctly. All right. So, so this is the kind of data collection where sometimes a drill, a hole is drilled, you know, if we're really fortunate, but sometimes it's really not anything more or less than a geologist climbing up a hill and taking out a hammer and, and chipping out a piece of the rock and taking, chipping out many pieces, in fact, and drilling out tiny pieces with a little, with a little drill bit and taking them back to the lab. And so what we get at Meishan, and this is, by the way, it's from Meishan, China, it's in South China. It's um, um, been defined as the so-called type section of the end Permian extinction. That is this, the uh, part of the world where everyone else's um, observation of the end Permian extinction is, is, is um, discussed relative to. And this is the isotopic event. And I'll define this quantity shortly, but right now I just want you to see that there's this um, you know, time series of, of some geochemical data that, that's collected. And then it's humming along doing nothing. So I would call that a steady state. And then it starts to rise. If you examine this with some carrot, it has the rise of a mathematical singularity, which by itself is an interesting fact. And it, if you wish, it's, it's, it's a kind of independent ev evidence of, of nonlinear dynamics within the carbon cycle. But just admiring it for what it is, I would say that um, one of the really important things to notice is that the mass extinction in Meishan, China begins here right when this thing hits its peak. So, you know, these things are related to each other. They're not independent. It's not, it's not, it's not you know, unlikely to be a random coincidence. And in fact, you know, this kind of analysis has been repeated at dozens of places around the globe and um, one sees the extinction at a time of um, such significant geochemical change. Um, I'll say also, um, just as a sort of scientific cultural matter, um, these dates, are dates obtained from the isotopes of uranium and lead. They're in millions of years. They have an error bar, which is plus or minus, call it, you know, 50 or 60,000, between 30 and 90,000 years, which is beginning to approach um, one part in 10,000, which is absolutely remarkable. And so the, the people who do this are called geochronologists and, and they, it, the, the technology and its ability to date things is, is fabulous. And so that in itself is worth wondering about. Um, so here's um, one of my main introductory points, and, and it's this. There's many mass extinctions in the geologic past. Um, the record we have extends back about 540 million years. It's, it's called the Phanerozoic Eon. Uh, Earth is 4.5 billion years old, but the kinds of organisms that leave shell that, that that, that leave, have hard parts that leave, you know, shells that you can see, you know, lived in, in, in this, this period of time. And it's been known um, since, well, 
aspects of this, this, uh, this, this data have been known since the mid 19th century, but the idea that there's five sort of uh, main mass extinctions that are somewhat bigger than the others um, is, has been known um, pretty much since mid 20th century. And that's one we were just looking at. It's the, at the Permian Triassic boundary. There's another at the Triassic Jurassic boundary. Um, the KT is the one that children learn about in school because it's now called, by the way, its name has been changed to KP, the Cretaceous Paleogene. Um, before I made this slide, but I, I kind of like the traditional term myself. And so um, that's when the dinosaurs died. And that is, um, as many people know, it's attributed to a, an impact with an extraterrestrial object. This is the end of the Ordovician. And this is the one that none of you have heard of probably, well, few of you have probably heard of it. It's in the Devonian, it's called the Franian Fermanian extinction. Now, one thing that's um, worth noting is that um, these last three have been subject to very careful geochronology. And what we can say without equivocation is that there are periods of massive volcanism uh, that create what geologists call large igneous provinces, and they occur during these three mass extinctions. So volcanism creates CO2 in the atmosphere, I mean, it put, adds CO2 into the atmosphere among other things. And so that, that's, a, that's an indication that you know, there's, there's some type of environmental response. So as an overview now, I'm almost done with the introduction. I'd like to point out the following. When people study these disruptions in the geologic past, it, up until now, it, these disruptions have been usually interpreted as a kind of proportionate response to external forcing. That is, there's some release of CO2. For example, um, a popular one to think about is methane. That is because uh, methane may be stored in solid form in the ocean, but when temperature gets sufficiently warm, there's a release of methane. And so sometimes people think that those um, uh, signals simply represent the addition of some carbon source from outside. Right? And what I'm going to do is assemble a, a fair bit of information that suggests instead that the magnitude of the events is not strictly a case of the external stressor, but rather the Earth system's intrinsic dynamics. Of course, there's still going to be a necessity to bring carbon into the system, but the carbon will be redistributed within the system as opposed to being imposed on it from outside. And we'll develop some understanding by taking that point of view. And one of the products of the understanding is that um, the results will provide a new way of looking at the past to establish its relevance to the present and the future. Uh, essentially, that would mean what in physics one would call a, a, a rescaling of, of time. And I'll show how time can be rescaled um, so that these slow events that um, occur, say, over tens of thousands of years in the geologic past can be made relevant to um, fast events like we're experiencing today. Okay, so now um, I'd like to portray the carbon cycle in modestly more depth, right? It's this loop between photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, this is, if you wish, the equation of the carbon cycle. You recognize CO2 and water, you recognize oxygen. CH2O might seem, it, it's, it's a shorthand for carbohydrate uh, organic matter. So carbon dioxide and water um, are combined by photosynthesis to make organic matter and oxygen as a byproduct. And organisms that respire like us, that is uh, those that um, consume the organic matter, use oxygen to effectively burn the organic matter or metabolize it and return CO2 system. Uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, things become environmentally um, more interesting when you, when you contextualize it, of course. Today, half of this process occurs in the ocean. And um, from a geologic point of view, the kinds of records we're dealing with, um, much of what 
uh, much of the effects that, that, that we see have to do with the leakages out of the ocean. And, and these leakages are, are burial, right? So not all the carbon that's fixed by, by photosynthesis is, is returned um, within the oceans. Some of it goes into sediment, and then within the sediments, not all of it is used by the organisms of the sediment. And as it turns out, it's about one part in a thousand that actually ends up as rock. And a similar but slightly larger fraction, a fraction of some uh, greater by a factor of four, a quantity greater than a factor of four by a factor of four, is um, the CO2, which ends up um, being buried as carbonate, carbonate rocks. And the records that I'll show you come from the inorganic carbon or carbonate. It basically, uh, they, they, they come from uh, the shells of car the carbonate shells of organisms that have been buried or the carbonate rocks. And volcanoes act as a source of CO2 and weathering effect. The weathering is a chemical reaction with rocks that effectively takes carbon from rocks and some from the atmosphere and puts it into the ocean and is eventually buried. Um, so, um, the isotopic composition of inorganic carbon, which I mentioned earlier, is uh, what we use to develop the records. And it's, um, it's pretty good at time scales greater than or about a thousand years. Right? So let me tell you a little bit about the data. Right? Um, the data are the, respectively the ratios of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And that's about one part in a hundred. However, the ratio fluctuates in time. Now, just I want you to recall or recognize that all of the carbon-13 on the planet is conserved as is all of the carbon-12. It's a stable isotope, right? And it's just 1% of it has the, heavy, is the heavier isotope. And so this quantity, this is, this is a, a geochemist definition. Um, those of you who had you know, a sort of physical science, I don't know, chemistry is a physical science, but let's just say a physics or, a, <laughs> or even a geophysics education, um, might find this a somewhat overburdensome uh, quantity. It's kind of complicated, but just to unpack it for you, it's the difference between a, a ratio that you measure and a standard ratio divided by the standard ratio multiplied by a thousand, right? So the units are per mil, therefore parts per thousand. And so the last, fact I want you to recognize here is, is why are there fluctuations? Well, photosynthesis favors the light isotope. It's because all reactions do. And photosynthesis is, is a fast reaction, so it has a strong signal. Right? And so therefore, the carbon that was in the atmosphere, the lighter isotope is selected if, um, if more favorably when organic matter is made. So we basically go from carbon, which is isotopically heavy to carbon, which is isotopically lighter. Now, the records I'll show you, right, are records in which we take this, my interpretation of the records, so we take the organic carbon and we transform it to CO2. And so you imagine that there's a sort of surplus of the organic carbon, which is what I'm putting my cursor over. And now we increase the flux, right? So that's what these arrows represent. So I'm gonna basically make a more powerful flux. It's out of steady state. And this is a respiration flux, right? And so if I have a respiration flux that leads from the organic matter to CO2, that means that the isotopic composition of CO2 will decrease transiently or temporarily as it become lighter. And as I mentioned, my curves are reversed. That lighter isotopic composition will be a spike pointing upwards on my plots, right? So here we have again that N Permian signal, right? And what I'm going to show you <clears throat> is um, basically uh, an empirical analysis of effectively all the major events in the last 540 million years that we have some some confidence or, or global events. Uh, I'll show you the collection in a moment, but what I've done is, 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 is assemble from the literature, these events. It's a little bit like, you know, um, instead of studying seismograms, I study the earthquakes, right? I study, study the events themselves. Right? And um, I, the major 
um, very, um, parameters or um, descriptors in the database are the magnitude of the change, right, delta r, and the time scale over which it exists. In other words, I think of this as a system that's initially in steady state and is then stressed out or forced out of steady state. It's forced out of steady state for a period tau, right? And it's amount by which it goes out of steady state is this uh, delta r, right? So those are the, those are the, the main quantities. And um, I have a database. So this is just a histogram and it's histogram in terms of the date. So what you should see here is it's not that important, but there's a somewhat greater preponderance of the, of the data in the recent, um, you know, in, in the last hundred million years compared to the last 500 for obvious reasons that there are more rocks and it's easier to find. Um, these are their names. I will not ask you to memorize them, um, but they will show some, a few of them will show up later. But the red ones are the, the um, mass extinction events, right? And so the, I'll, I'll maintain that color scheme. The, uh, the acronyms are, you know, what they are. You'll see them on another slide. Then they'll vanish, so you don't have to worry about them too much. But I do want to impart for you a bit of the complexity of the subject to know that uh, when somebody like me comes along and assembles a database, the only kind of person that can do this, I think, has to have a certain patience so that when they come across um, things with names like early, late, Paleocene event, they don't give up, right? And that, that's some... Um, uh, it came as, as a bit of a shock to me, but you know, I, I just I persevered. Right? But when you think about it, there's a sense to it because first there was a late Paleocene event and then later there was another one that came before and that's why it's called the early late Paleocene event. Okay, so this is the raw data, right? We take the magnitude of the change, right? And I put it on a plot and um, ask, well, what can we say? So there's one feature that stands out immediately, and that's that this upper triangular region is, is relatively empty, except mostly for this um, outlier, which is you know the the, the big one, the, the Permian Triassic extinction, right? The one that's the most um, damaging. The others are sort of in the lower triangular region, and you can see there's a sort of a limit here. All right, and, and what that limit represents is almost like a line you could draw that's a barrier. Uh, it, it, the obvious interpretation here is that except for uh, these exceptions, there's a sort of limiting rate. It, it, things don't get faster than a certain rate because this is the amount of the shift as a function of time. You don't see stuff up here because that would uh, require a big change over a short period of time. The Earth system needs time to make its changes and, and those changes occur on the bottom triangular region. And to go further, um, we need to do, oh, I need to do something and I suspect you'll be grateful for it. Is that I, I'm not a chemist. I'm not, I'm not a geochem, I mean, I'm not a geochemist, I'm not a chemist and so on. Um, but I, I made it my business to learn what these data represent. And, and in doing that, uh, I've learned how to transform the chemical signals to a physical signal. It's not that unusual, but you know, I, I, I do it in a way that's I, I think revealing. And, and now we can talk, we can turn this into a physical um, phase diagram as you'll see in a moment. And, and the way I do it is, and fundamentally this, this, is, this is, is not usually innovative as uh, other people do forms of it, right? And what I do is I, I assume the changes derived from an imbalance between respiration and production. Uh, you've heard me say that already. And then I convert the isotopic changes to a net respiration flux. And then I integrate that flux to get a, a, a change in mass. And um, it's in this relative change because uh, chemistry or at least this kind of chemistry gives ratios. It doesn't give absolute quantities. And then I plot it, right? And that's the next step. And now, um, if you feared that I was going off into a hopelessly complicated um, realm, I think I rescued the situation somewhat. Right? It's still complicated, but it's not quite as hopeless as before, right? And so the, there's, you know, what in physics one would almost, a, one would call almost a data collapse, right? That, that um, sort of shadow of a limiting rate now shows up as a kind of characteristic rate here. 
because we, we can imagine a line that we draw from here to here. And uh, it's a barrier that separates effectively about four of the five mass extinction events from everything else, all right? And so I think of this line here as a characteristic flux, and I'm gonna draw a line through it, all right? And that, that, that line that I'm drawing is a, um, it's not a fit, it's a line that represents in the modern carbon cycle, a certain rate of carbon release. And it's equal to the rate at which organic carbon is buried in rocks. I won't really use that in, in fact in a later talk, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, magnitude. I, you might recall, I said it, it turns out to be one part in a thousand of primary production. So that, that should give you, it, it, it's a modest, change, but integrated over time, it, it amounts to something significant. This is the amount by which the total carbon in the oceans change. So this represents a, basically a 10% increase, 100% right, increase, uh, and so on. All right. So what really captures my attention here is the fact that there seems to be this characteristic rate, right? and so a characteristic flux, because that signifies that there's something about the system that's sort of generating something reasonably repeatedly, right? That it's, it's sort of, when it's stressed, it responds in a certain way, and this is how it responds. It depends on how long, you, you know, it, as a function of its time scale, that the size is a sort of, you know, uh, proportionate to its time scale. So the question is why? And that's a lot of what will pass. In, in the remainder of uh, the hour, so to speak, right? And uh, so as, as a juncture, and I, I see it's conveniently exactly halfway through the talk in terms of the number of slides, right? Um, I'll call, have this, what I'll call the emerging picture, right? We have a bunch of events, right? Half of them I call characteristic events. They fall more or less on that line you know, within its error bars. Um, above those are the great catastrophes, the, the four of the five mass extinctions of, of the geologic past. By the way, um, you know, the Zoom format doesn't allow me to make eye contact with people. And so I don't necessarily see the dismayed looks like, what is this? <laughs> All right, that's the, why isn't that on the other side? I, I wanna comment on that for a moment. Um, uh, there's debate among paleontologists whether the franian femenian event is actually an extinction event. Some people think it's a lack of origination of new species. Um, I'm not going to enter that debate here. Let's just say it's different than, than the, other, the other four. Right. So we have the catastrophes, four of the five over here, characteristic events, and then we have what I'll call minor events. Right. And so I'm going to make the hypothesis that I've, I've been, you know, leaning towards, you know, um, since, since this talk started. I consider as a hypothesis, the characteristic events and catastrophes result from nonlinear amplification of perturbations that is the system is perturbed and then it has its ability to um, go down a, a certain kind of path and that's a kind of characteristic path, right? And therefore, how, what, how does that work? Well, I mean, like, like any other nonlinear system, I'm worried. Uh, I'll point out why nonlinearity is, is important later. But the rates and amplitudes would be set by natural mechanisms that act to damp the perturbations. So there'll be an amplifying mechanism that can amplify it only so much until damping makes it damp out. All right, so that's, that's um, my suspicion, and I will try to make that case. Um, to make that case, um, at this point, I, I rather than just telling the story of it, I'm going to provide an, an example by a mathematical model, right? And to basically um, impart the, the ideas that of this, um, basically to give you a sense of a general mechanism that could give rise to such behavior. And what I'm going to do is consider that, the, consider the ocean, because that's, that's where the data comes from the oceans and at time scales greater than a couple of centuries, that's what controls the carbon cycle. You're right, that, that's, that's where the carbon cycle is, if you wish. And there's 
by a geochemical reaction. Inorganic ones and you know, and biological ones we call it biogeochemical. And so I think of this as an open nonlinear reactor. Carbon comes in, and how does it come in? It comes in through rivers, right? And it also comes in when there's um, extra CO2 in the atmosphere, it comes in like, like there is today, it comes in by absorption of the CO2. But come in, in a normal steady state, it comes in through rivers and it goes out through this carbon burial um, that, that I talked about earlier. And inside it's reacting, right? And so um, I'll think of this as a potentially nonlinear reactor and ask how it might behave. So um, why am I interested in nonlinearities? Because I, I, I'm interested in um, mechanisms of self-amplification, um, widely known as positive feedbacks. And the kinds of positive feedbacks that interest me are the ones that involve respiration, the, the, the back reaction of the carbon cycle, not photosynthesis, but the way back, the one that takes the organic carbon and converts it to CO2. Right. So respiration depends on a great many factors, and I'm mentioning two of interest is temperature and um, carbonate ion concentrations. Right. Um, temperature, it, it's because metabolic rates um, increase with increasing temperature, and that could change the balance between photosynthesis and respiration. The uh, carbonate ion concentration is um, less obvious, I think, to, to many people. And, but it's because um, as the concentration of carbonate ions changes in the oceans, the uh, uh, planktonic organisms that make shells have an increasingly hard time to make the shells. It's essentially related to ocean acidification. And it might change the rate at which um, organic carbon sinks from the surface to the depth and therefore is buried. And um, a kind of uh, character, like a uh, simplification of a, of a, of a textbook um, description of this process is here. And I'm going to, in the next few slides, focus on that effect. I, I'm not by any means saying that this is how it works always through geologic time. What I'm saying is this is one way of thinking about the problem. And this, uh, picture is, is what um, oceanographers refer to as the biological pump. Think of CO2 as being up here. Um, there are planktonic organisms that take the CO2 and um, essentially, um, or the carbonate, which is dissolved in the oceans, and they convert it to, uh, to shells. And then the shells fall down when the organism dies and they drag down organic matter with them. Some of it is respired to CO2 and others is buried. And so now you imagine that you have some type of, of um, process, increasing CO2 makes the ocean more acidic, um, decreases, um, as it's, and it decreases the carbonate concentration. Less of these shells will fall down, less of, them shell, less of the shells might, might form. And there's a possible positive feedback because if there's less of a pump taking the CO2 from the atmosphere to, to, to the sediments, then there's more CO2 left in the shallow, shallow ocean and uh, CO2 levels rise and the process can feed upon itself, right? That's not a new idea, right? Um, however, uh, what I'm going to do is mathematize it and see where it leads, right? And so uh, this is one of my most detailed slides. I I'm sorry for it. Uh, uh, my, my point here is just that we go from this picture, all right, which I think is nicely simple, to this picture, which is less simple, and um, encode this picture into two ordinary differential equations, which essentially say the same thing. There's a flux in, there's a flux out. There's a flux in, out, there's a damping time scale, and this is the respiration feedback. Um, it turns out that if, you, uh, if you're interested in what we call the carbonate system in the oceans. Uh, some understanding of chemistry is unfortunately necessary. And it turns out that um, from a mathematical point of view to understand the, the whole of the equilibrium system of the, what, we call, what we call carbonate equilibria, you have to track at least two variables. This one is called alkalinity. This is called the totality of dissolved inorganic carbon. 
I don't want to dwell on those in, in this point. I'm just suffice to say that um, we have model with reservoirs of alkalinity and dissolved in organic carbon, and they're essentially these, these nonlinear open chemical reactors. All right. Um, with a little bit of uh, modest effort, those equations can be you know, developed a little bit more into something which I know may look more simple to you or may look less simple, but I'm writing it down because these are the ones I actually use. Um, the main point here is that um, these functions S and, and S bar are um, where the nonlinearities go. Right? Um, some of them can be argued about rigorously and others are um, hypotheses that is, uh, for, for how things behave. Right, this the burial one is um is, is is correct, right? This one is a hypothesis. My point is that I'm constructing models like this as a way of forming hypotheses for how things might have behaved, and I essentially want to explain how characteristic rates might occur. And so I use this model. Um, the first thing that anyone does when writing down to coupled ordinary differential equations is to ask if the system is stable. It is when there's a stable fixed point, which means there's just one stable steady state. And so this model exhibits um, a limit cycle under certain conditions in parameter space. So there's no need for me to dwell on what these parameters mean right now, but uh, you know, well, this is the burial rate, it's the strength of the nonlinearity, and this has something to do with the uh, response of planktonic organisms to um, carbonate levels or ocean acidification. My point here is that there's the possibility of a limit cycle. A limit cycle is a periodic um, change, well, periodic changes in say CO2 levels. And I wanna say something more about limit cycles now because this is going to be an elementary but fundamental remark, which is um, going to be used in, in the remainder of the talk. Um, this is a limit cycle, right, in, in the, what, what we call the phase plane. So there's two parameters in this phase plane, the carbonate concentration and the total dissolved in organic carbon. Limit cycles are oscillations. Once you know this one, you can get any of the other chemical constituents in the oceans, and this is what the, the oscillations look like. They have this funny form because they're nonlinear oscillations. So you have things that look like sawtooths, you know, and things that look sort of like spikes over here. Right. Um, Limit cycles are distinct from linear oscillations, a system, a linear system. If you have a linear system, when you initialize it somewhere, you just go off in this orbit in which its amplitude um, depends entirely on the initial condition. The amplitude here does not depend on the initial condition. If we start near the fixed point here, the initial steady state, the amplitude grows until it reaches this, this bold curve. If we start outside it, it goes in, right? I'm sure many of you have seen this um, at one point or another in, in your mathematics education, but if you're not, let's just call it a characteristic oscillation that occurs in nonlinear systems. And this is the point here on the right. The size and the period of the limit cycle, which by the way, in this system is 10,000 years. It's 10,000 years because of um, what that's the natural damping time scale for uh, ocean acidification in the carbon cycle. Right? The size of it, its amplitude and its period are properties of the system. They're not properties of its perturbation. So in other words, it's a free oscillation. You know, this, you have the system with the right sort of parameters. It undergoes these oscillations and it just has that amplitude. It has no other amplitude, that's it. Right, and, and, it, and it comes along with a period, right? And so now um, I didn't show you any, any oscillatory events. And um, so I'm not gonna directly apply limit cycles to the problem. However, the fact that the system can have a limit cycle in theory is going to be important. So we consider again, our, our sort of schematic picture. And now I'm going to have as a parameter an input rate of CO2. Right, so imagine the system is in steady state, and then I input some CO two. You can think of it as from volcanoes. You can think of it as you know from anthropogenic um, you know inputs. And what happens? Well, it turns out that there's a critical rate of input that is a critical injection rate. 
below that injection rate, the system behaves when it's stable exactly as you would expect. It, you, you, know, you, you perturb it, that's the, uh, the steady state, you perturb it a little bit and it just sort of cycles back into its, um, to its initial, initial um, condition. So that's what stable systems do. You push them away from their steady state, they go back to it. And this is what the time series looks like that would be associated with that. You see a minor blip associated with the perturbation and relaxation back to the steady state. Right. Now we increase the injection rate just a little bit more. Right. And so on these graphs, you can't even see the change. It turns out it's the distance between this dot and that initial condition. Now what happens is the system explores the, uh, the entire phase space before it comes back. So it's actually, strictly speaking, it's a stable system, but when you push it a little bit away from its steady state, it acts as if it's unstable before going back to the steady state. And what you get is this spike event. Now, um, these kinds of systems are, are in dynamical systems theory are known as excitable systems. And they're very familiar to biophysicists, especially in neuroscience, because neurons behave this way. If you inject a modest current into a neuron, it remains quiescent. If you inject just a little bit more above the threshold for the neuron, it fires a spike, right? And that's the spike here. So it's, these, this carbon cycle model falls into the, a, 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 the class of excitable systems. It's a different set of equations, but it's the same type of behavior because many different types of, um, uh, m m many different specific dynamical systems can fall in, into general classes. Now, um, you might wonder where that um, shape comes from, all right? And I'll tell you about it in a moment. I'm gonna tell you now. Notice this shape looks a lot like this shape. In fact, it's virtually the same thing. It's just on a slightly different graph. What's happened here, the reasons these occur is because we're in the stable um, region of the, of the uh, parameter space. But there's essentially a sort of shadow of the limit cycle that exists that you're getting close to because you're not so far from what we call the bifurcation or you know, the unstable point, right? And so the system briefly it sort of hops on to the limit cycle, but it can't stay there because it's stable. So it goes back in. So the point is, is that these excitations um, have the properties of limit cycles. Right? And that's the point I'm gonna make shortly. Right? Here, I wanna show you that the, in, in the model, at least the transition, this, this is the injection rate a dimensionless injection rate of CO2. And what you see is that there's a, a reasonably sharp but continuous transition and then a constant amplitude, all right? And here's the point. As for limit cycles, the amplitude and the time scale of excitations are properties of the system. They're not properties of the perturbation. It doesn't matter if I hit it hard or harder, as long as it's above the threshold, it behaves this way. So it becomes independent of how the system is, is, is excited it, the excitation itself behaves the same way all the time. And so that begins to explain um, a possible mechanism for why we can get a characteristic rate. And I'll say that shortly. And just there's one more complicated graph. I showed you phase diagrams like this before, but the excitable region is a fairly significant part of phase space. It doesn't require being sent over a boundary. It just requires a modest perturbation. And the interesting part is mostly over here. Right? So it's a significant part of phase space in the model and one would expect in any system. Okay, so now let's return to our, our picture. Right? Um, with what I've shown so far, I am led to the following interpretation. The characteristic events are near threshold excitations. That is, we excite them just above the threshold and then they, they basically fire their spikes, right? And their amplitude is, is, is easily deduced once you, want, once you realize it's related to the limit cycle and, and so on. There are a character, there's a flux in the model and a, and a time scale. There is in the real world too. There's a rate at which 
carbon comes into the system from rivers and there's a way, a rate at which, um, a, a time scale over which carbon stays in the ocean or specifically the damping time scale here, which is 10,000 years. So knowing those two terms, you know, we basically get a good, a good estimate of the, um, of, of the amplitude. Catastrophes, uh, I'll interpret as a, excitations well beyond threshold. That's not an exclusive interpretation, but that's the way it fits into this picture. I, I or we, you know, have a better understanding of the characteristic events. But catastrophes you can think of as um, enough to make the system um, you know, fire its spike, but even more so that it's 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 um, it's pushed well beyond it. And minor events are just literally that they, I would say they represent a quasi-static response to subthreshold forcing. So you don't force them by much. Um, they stay in steady state, but they exhibit um, a, 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 a record of, you know, how it was forced. So it's these minor events, which um, satisfy the, uh, um, the hypothesis, which I was essentially trying to disprove in, um, throughout this talk that is, they do record a record of how the system is stressed, whereas these I'm suggesting are nonlinear events, which are recording um, how the system itself behaves rather than the history of its stressor. Okay, so in the remainder of the talk, I'd like to, to, to make some remarks about um, what we've learned and in, in the following sense, I showed you a bunch of data in the beginning. I then showed you um, a model which necessarily is somewhat more specific than all of the data can possibly be. It's, 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 it's a sort of hypothesis for how things happen, but it's not the only way things can happen. However, it does identify a mechanism, I mean, a, a generic mechanism. And in this case, it's uh, excitability, right? And if you study it with in any detail, in, in actually just modest detail, what you realize is that the model is an example of one class of, of what these days tend to be called tipping points, right? That is, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you a tipping point diagram in a moment, but you know, you go past some limit and then the system behaves nonlinearly. That, that's essentially you know, the tipping point. And this is a tipping point, which is sensitive to the rate of something as opposed to its value, right? The rate of change, right? And so the rate, the rate that we have here is, is the rate of CO2 injection. And so basically the excitation occurs when the rate exceeds a critical rate, nu C. Now, think about that for a moment. You saw, I'm essentially saying that that characteristic rate is the critical rate, all right? But now imagine that you know, during this talk or during this slide or during this second, um, somehow the CO2 levels um, around the whole planet increased by one ppm. Now, just happened. Well, then the rate of change is, is virtually infinite, right? But nobody will care. They're not any of the organisms living and certainly not us, right? And so, so there's something incomplete about the way I've stated it. And the incompleteness is that the critical rate must be sustained for a sufficiently long time. I'll, I'll present another way of discussing that in a moment, right? And so that then indicates to you that the critical rate depends on the time scale over which the system is perturbed, right? And so here's um, a kind of new take on a classic tipping point diagram. And so this is by no means a, a standard one, but it, it's it's a it's a you know, motion of a rolling ball with some potential wells, but now we focus on rates, rates of change. And so let's look at the slower than critical rate first. Imagine that what we do is we move these potential wells, right? We just move them to the right. This ball rolls, and so it has some inertia, it's gonna wanna stay where it is, all right? Um, however, if you move this thing slow enough, the ball stays, where it is more or less, right? It, it, it sort of goes uphill a little bit, doesn't go over the hump. And, and at, at some later time, T2, it's in the, in the, still at the bottom of that potential. Well, however, it's moved and therefore the system state is moved. So 
Now let's go faster than the critical rate. Same picture. However, now it's moving faster. And because it's moving faster, the ball goes over the, over the hump, right? And it goes over the hump and ends up in a different state, right? So this, this is an example of rate-induced tipping, right? But one thing to note is that you have to move far enough, right? If you don't move far enough, there's no way that the ball is ever gonna get over the hill, right? It has to be moved at least this far, otherwise it's not gonna happen. And so the way that translates to, the, to, to our system is that there's not just a critical rate, but there's a critical mass. So you have to have added at least a certain amount um, to the system um, for, for, for the uh, critical rate to matter. And so these things uh, obviously uh, interact with each other. And so the way I'll express it first is that at CO2 injection time scales greater than the damping time, but that's the damping time scale, which basically describes what's fast and what's slow, right? Excitation follows, you know, this is sort of what I'll think of as the sort of long time critical rate. But now imagine that we're, you know, making a relatively impulsive change, right? like we are today over a century period of time as opposed to 10,000 years, right? Then what matters is the critical mass. It's not a critical rate. Right? But the critical mass can be related to a critical rate by dividing it by the time scale. So if you put it all together, and this is just you know, uh, you know uh, elementary algebra at this point, the short time, or if you wish, um, mass conservation. I mean, if you want to put a certain amount of mass into the system and you have less time to put it in, then the rate scales like one over the time. That's what this says. It's nothing more, nothing less. Right? And so you can see that quite clearly in the model. You get this one over T. Um, uh, or you know, or T inverse um, scaling of the critical rate. That is, if, if as the time scale over which you stress the system gets shorter, if you if you're going to lead it to unstable behavior, um, the 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 spike or the excitation, you have to basically um, add in the carbon at a faster rate. Right, and so. Um, this summarizes it. You can choose your interpretation. There's either critical mass or critical rate in the system, right? Let's first look at the critical mass, right? There's a crossover time scale. This is the damping time scale of the system. It's the time scale over which the ocean naturally damps out perturbations. If you stress the system faster than that or shorter time scale, what matters in this picture is, is the critical mass, right? You have to have at least that much. And this is separating the stable regime from the excitation or the extinction. Beyond that, the line picks up, and this is the this is essentially like like the um like the diagram I showed you with the data. That's the characteristic rate. We don't have any data that, that's at this um, short time scale, right? But it can also be expressed in terms of a critical rate which um, now has the opposite kind of behavior. There's a constant critical rate when the, um, the injection time scale is longer than the damping time scale, but when it's shorter, the critical rate grows to the left like one over T, where T is the time scale of injection. Now I've spent a lot of time on what is fundamentally a, a fairly simple idea. And, and the reason I've done that is because I think it's significant, right? And I'm gonna first show you why it's significant in the model, and then I'll argue why it's significant for interpretations of the geologic past. And this is the spiking model we have. It's the same model I showed you before. And these are the injections of CO2. Subcritical injection or subthreshold injection leads to a little blip. You increase the injection rate a little bit more and you get, that's the spike, right? But now we do it at one tenth the time. So you can't see the separation here because you know, the, the pixels are too close to each other. But this is essentially, if you think of this as 10,000 years and this is 1,000 years, it takes more, right? You have to add more and if you get, Below the threshold, you get this little blip, and then you get above the threshold, you get the spike. And as you can see, that spike looks just like the other one. Right? It's the same thing, right? It's just here you had to um, you, you had to uh, inject carbon 
at a much greater rate because it's a shorter time. So now let's go to the real world, all right? And I show you two sets, one set of data and one set of um, you know, uh, model simulations. First, from our model, we can make a fairly conservative estimate of what the threshold is for, and this is now a rate because it's pentagrams carbon per year. Right? And that's this line. Now we examine, this is the Cretaceous Paley gene or Cretaceous tertiary event. There is an absolutely marvelous piece of ge geochronological work by Blair Shaney's group at Princeton that has um, dated all of the magma that's come out of um, that what's called the Deccan traps in India and has made a, a very interesting attempt to measure the rate at which um, the magma is being produced by the uh, volcanism just before the KT extinction. Now, of course, we know that the KT extinction is associated with a bolide impact, but it's also associated with volcanism. The volcanism begins about 10,000 years before the extinction. And or, or I should say it begins a little bit long, long more be, before the extinction, but there's a pulse, right? And that pulse um, has this magnitude, it's at, at this rate, right? This is, um, these are error bars for its rate, right? And it has a rate that shows up on, on the curve here. And as you can see, compared to the present rate at which oceans are taking up carbon, it's a hundred times slower. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely modest. An extinction occurs afterwards, but it, you know, it's a modest rate. And why it's significant is because it extends over 10,000 years of time. What's going on here is extending over only 100 years of time. And so the modern CO2 flux is 100 times greater. Right? So that in itself is alarming. And you will see this if you haven't already, you see this in the news reports and the literature all the time from people like me who, who write papers about these ancient events. You go to like the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, a very well studied event. You measure the apparent rate of uh, car carbon increase and you see that it is um, uh, much slower than the rate of carbon increase we see today. And so, you know, by, by an order of magnitude or more, right? and some, sometimes two orders of magnitude. And so the idea is that we, you know, we had this awful event in the past and what we're doing now is at a much greater rate. So you know, what's going on? And so what I'm saying is this is what's going on. They're both bad, right? But they're equivalent. It's not that the modern event is a hundred times worse than the ancient event. It's roughly similar. And it's similar because of this rescaling. That the, the critical rate um, is increased by a factor of 100, right? And because it's time scale decreased by a factor of 100. So the two effects cancel out. And that's what the statement says. And so one expects they'd have similar outcomes. I am not going to sit here and tell you that that volcanic pulse is what gave rise to the KT extinction. That would be highly irresponsible given that, um, you know, there's a bolide impact, right? Um, on the other hand, um, there are certainly many, many speculations that the, uh, the magmatism, volcanism before the impact also played a role. Okay, and so finally, this will be my, 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 my final data slide before the conclusions. We talked about critical rates now a lot. Now I'm just gonna say, of course, the critical rate can be translated to a critical mass. And I often get this question, the amount of carbon we put in the oceans today is this green line. Um, climate scientists tend to use these representative concentration pathways as, uh, as, as typical um, you know, scenarios for how um, CO2 levels might change. And what you see, these, these are projections for the year 2100. And this is the critical rate that's also the critical mass that's associated with the critical rate, which comes out of this work, which is essentially read off the data plots, the characteristic plots that I've shown you, right? And what you can see is that we, we will likely exceed it um, you know, before the end of the century. Now, what happens after we exceed it is of course a huge open question. And um, the 
implications of this work, of course, is that there then becomes a, a runaway instability, which is eventually arrested and returns to a steady state. But the literal um, implication is that that runaway occurs at a time scale of the damping time scale, which is 10,000 years. And so that's given the mechanisms that I've, I've I've, I've addressed in the model, that's the time scale over which the huge changes take place. Um, on the other hand, we have really no idea of um, what kinds of feedbacks would occur in the intervening time. If they're not damping feedbacks and they serve to amplify things, it's troublesome. It's uh, not impossible to imagine that there could be ecological interactions that act to damp the system. And it's an open question. Okay, so. And with that, um, uh, I'll conclude. Um, my main points are, are listed here. Um, there's a type of disruption of the carbon cycle, and I'll call it a characteristic disruption. And what it requires, following the work here, is an above threshold input of carbon. You exceed the threshold, you get the disruption, right? And the same disruption can follow either from a large impulsive input, that's the modern problem, I've been talking about, or at a relatively slow rate. Maybe you can call it the paleo problem, right? And so um, my point here is that I believe what this work does is it provides a quantitative way of looking at the geologic events at a slow time scale and saying, these are relevant and they're relevant when you rescale them appropriately. And the rescaling is with the T inverse, one, one over T scaling. Um, and finally, I'll mention now, uh, you know, if any of you um, haven't had enough of me, you know, I imagine you had over the past hour, you can find some, um, you know, descriptions of the work here. This, this one is, is, um, is the only one in the annual review, which is, um, uh, you know, has a paywall in front of it. So if you want to read it, just send me an email. In fact, send me an email for it if you have any questions too. Okay, thank you. Wow. <laughs> well, okay, Dan, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to figure out, oh my gosh, so which of these questions we've already received should I ask you? Um, I'm going to have to reduce the number quite a bit because we're running low on time here. But um, let, me, let me ask kind of like a, to even see, you know, if this model can explain some things that would be different from what you've already shown us. Like, so could a catastrophic change in carbon levels happen in reverse? For example, if a large fraction of mammals died, but few plants died because of a volcano or asteroid, could there be a sudden drop in CO2 to instigate or propagate an ice age? Uh, absolutely. And in, indeed, um, uh, the Ordovician event, uh, mass extinction, is widely thought to be a um, a global cooling event. So the the um, the way in which global cooling um, is often interpreted from these isotopic geochemical points of view, or the carbon cycle as I described it, is as there's an increase in the rate of carbon burial. If you increase the rate of carbon burial, then you're effectively um, amplifying the sink for carbon in the ocean, and that takes the CO2 out of the system, and that leads to a cooling. So um, Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's perfectly reasonable. I, um, in this work, have been studying um, the, what we call negative excursions, which in my plots point upwards, um, because they're more easily understood. The Ordovician data shows up in my compilation, but I study its downturn as opposed to its upturn. Okay, somewhat different question. Are rising or falling sea levels a possible cause of mass extinctions? In worst case, how high could the oceans rise during the century, which I think is what are on a lot of people's minds because um, sea level rise seems to be one of the first things we expect to see from what's going on. Yeah. Um, so if you look in the IPCC report, what, what you'll see is a, a set of projections which kind of parallel my next to last slide with these RCP scenarios, representative concentration pathways. And they, they vary from about six, six tenths of a meter to 1.1 meters by the year 2100, as, as, as the, the increase in sea level relative to the year 2000. 
So we're talking about on the order of, you know, the better part of a meter of, um, of sea level rise. I, I, I might, can I add your, your uh, yeah. yeah, I might, I might add to that, that um, uh, sea level of, has always changed in the geologic past. And uh, it changes with a tremendous amplitude. Um, uh, basically it's cyclic and um, has a period, a dominant period of about, uh, you know, a couple of hundred million years or so. And it has a mag an amplitude of about um, uh, 150 meters. <laughs> so there's 300 meters change in sea level. So sea level has been so different in the geologic past that for instance, there was a vast um, seaway in North America called the, I can't think of the Western Seaway or something. But anyway, it was, it was, it was underwater. The sea level was so much higher in the past. Yeah. So, so maybe the sea level rise is not the big issue anyway. The big issue sounds like if we cross a threshold, which you think could happen this century, it could uh, fall off something or some non well, 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 I mean, yes and no. I mean, it, sea level is a big deal because, um, uh, I mean, I, look, I haven't been to Miami for years, but, um, you know, <laughs> I, I can see pictures. And, you know, it, it's close to sea level. Sea level rises a little bit, and um, you know, uh, you may think that that's nothing. But now a big storm comes away, and what used to be, you know, protected seawall is suddenly breached, and so then it's 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 hugely important. And so the, talking about a meter change in sea level is, I mean, even at MIT, it's a concern. It's, um, right. You know, those so it's not like it's there. not a it's not like it's not a threat or concern. Or huge. Significant damage could occur, and everything. But it's not extinction. Extinction is something far more severe. Well, yes, because extinction is the loss of, um, you, know, <laughs> you know, all life or a, a large fraction of it. Um, but I might add that um, sea level change has long been implicated as in hypotheses for what causes mass extinctions. Okay. So, because is that because that? Most uh, life in the oceans lives in shallow water compared to deep water. Versus? Certainly, the life that we see in the fossil record, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so yes, yeah, yes. I mean, that's essentially it. You know, you, you can you can lower sea level or raise it and vastly change um, you know, the, you know, the configuration of things. Things that were connected once are now unconnected, and vice versa. Right. So to what extent can you really say that we will cross a CO2 threshold for mass extinction later this century? Um, aren't they the result of many intertwined function factors and might the rise in CO2 be an effect rather than a cause? Yeah, these are all good points. Um, let, let me maybe address the, the biggest one here is that, um, I can imagine that my talk gives the impression that CO2 levels are driving everything. And uh, if I left you with that impression, uh, I'm sorry because of maybe my enthusiasm and limited time. Those CO2 signals can be an effect of what's going on as opposed to a cause. They could be an effect of changes in you know, uh, life, but more likely, um, they could be an effect of other changes that are occurring in the environment, which then interact with other things, which eventually show up in the carbon cycle. Um, I personally tend to think of the carbon cycle as fundamental because it, it, it effectively describes the interaction of life in the environment. So I um, sort of combine all of these things as being members of the carbon cycle. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that um, particularly in the case of mass extinctions and maybe in the case of all of these events, um, it's probably unreasonable to attribute them to any one thing. I'm calling them, I'm, 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 I'm asking whether there are instabilities and I'm providing evidence of them. But once the earth system undergoes any kind of instability, all sorts of other things will happen. And um, it's a bit like asking what was the cause of the 2008 financial crisis? You know, you, you could point to you know, mortgages or, you know, or, or whatever your favorite instigating mechanism is, but a lot of things have suddenly changed. They, they act together, so right. feedback. So let's say for, for a second though, that the, the, the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is in fact a, a function that's going to 
lead to a, a instability and in fact we may cross that threshold within the century. Is there a way to actually reverse this whole process in advance? Yeah, so, so you know, in, in my talk, I'm, I'm basically trying to say, these are the data and this is what I feel I can say, you know, based on these data and um, a few hypotheses, right? Um, what's really missing and what's needed is an understanding of specific mechanisms that, 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 that are um, you know, holding sway over the system. And a better understanding of those specific mechanisms will then lead to a better understanding of the feedbacks in the system. And a better understanding of the feedbacks will then allow us to say, well, you know, this really is a runaway and it's going to occur over X years, or well, this is seemingly a runaway, but if we just do the following kind of intervention, we'll nip it in the bud. And that's going to depend entirely on the extent to which we understand how the system works. Right, which, which you're saying we really don't at the moment, right? What, what, what I, I think we, we, you know, climate science is, is, is relatively good despite controversy and understanding things like so-called climate sensitivity is you, you increase CO2 levels by so much, how much is the equilibrium climate, and, you know, and temperature increase. It's necessarily less strong at understanding um, um, long-term feedbacks. And, and, and these, uh, these uh, in a sense point to the sort of ultimate existential problem, but you know, we're not gonna get them from models. And this is in a sense, one of my subsidiary points. I, I feel it's uh, most important to sort of you know, examine, or it is important to examine the ancient events and to ask what, what various kinds of data can tell us about how they behave. And that gives an indication of what the feedbacks could be. Well, you know, the bottom line question I think for many people is uh, just succinctly, are we going to make it? You know, I mean, <laughs> are we, you know, is this already too late? Or, you know, I mean, where, where do you yeah. think we stand? Like, that, first of all, like in this century, and then yeah. let's go out a few thousand years. What, what do you think about all this? Uh, I think if we're smart and we cooperate, we'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and so, so we're this big, we have big, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, who am I to say? <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I mean, I, I can almost speak more as a lay. I should speak more as a lay person here. I, I think you know, wealthy societies will find some way of muddling through the problems, and um, societies with less resources will have a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. So then, I guess the. the um... The, the wrap up question, if you will, would be compared to today, paleo climate events and mass extinctions occurred in very different environments at much different time scale. So how, I mean, do you feel that we can honestly use these as examples? Thanks for that. No, well, th th thanks for that. So this is, this, this is the main point that I'm trying to make is that if we, but by viewing these, these paleoclimate events as incipient instabilities, which is you know, the excitations I'm talking about. Um, we learn fundamental things about, uh, uh, about um, how these events play out in time. We basically end up being able to classify them according in, in, within the theory of dynamical systems. It's, it's sort of the, uh, the unwritten, you know, it's the talk that I didn't give, all right? And it's this classification, um, system is extremely powerful, and it tells you how systems become unstable and what to, and what um, what types of behaviors to expect. And the uh, the observation of rate induced tipping and its implications and the, this this one over t rescaling is is sort of application of such ideas. And and I think that's the way or well, one way in which um, a better understanding of uh, paleo climate can pay huge dividends. Well, that's great. Well, Dan, listen, I want to say thank you very much for, I mean, this was a tough one to follow, but um, I got to say it was really, really interesting too. And I think I learned, learned a tremendous amount. Um, typically, when we have our in-person events, we give you a bottle of California Cabernet, um, but that, that's not going to work tonight. So I'll just say a very hearty thank you so much for doing this. And unfortunately, I'm in the uh, unenviable position of having to thank myself. As opposed to moderating. Well, I'll thank you. Th thanks a lot for, <laughs> okay, for the invitation. I, I should have thought thank you in the beginning. In fact, that was an oversight. Well, that's, that's great. Okay, you want to say something briefly about our next event?
Um, Roger Ains. Roger Ains is a chief research science, scientist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And he has been looking at, uh, he's a climate scientist that's been looking particularly at negative emissions lately. And he's explored a lot of possible possibilities here and those that, that, that have great scalability. Um, so he, what he's going to talk about in just two weeks is what, what are some of these possibilities and will they be enough? Because I think we all know now that most of the IPC results indicate we're going to have to take some CO2 out of the atmosphere to, to keep within the, say, the one half to two degrees temperature rise. Uh, and so we're going to have to do negative emissions as well as eliminate all of the um, um, of the carbon dioxide we're putting in the air, the emissions in the first place. So I hope you'll all join us for that. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you again, Dan, and good night, everybody. Hope to see you again in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you.